Welcome to part four in this series called The Time of the End. In this message, we're going to cover what's called the 6,000 year Bible chronology. This Bible chronology is really a timeline of the plan of salvation. And it can be quite controversial where people say, well, you're, you're time setting. You are, uh, we are told that we are not to. Uh, determine or try to determine a definite hour, day and hour of Jesus coming. This is not an attempt to do that. What this is, is simply a way for us as God's people to understand where we are in the stream of time. The real message is not this message of a timeline or a chronology, but it is Revelation 14, 6 through 12. It's the three angels message. And this is because everyone will be judged before Christ returns. They will choose to be on his side or on Satan's side prior to Jesus' second coming. So a timeline, as you can see, will not benefit anyone if they think that Jesus is coming at this point in time and, oh, I can wait until that point in time to get ready. Probation is going to close for everyone on this planet sometime prior, and we don't know when that time is. And so... The important message is the three angels' messages. And nobody knows when their probation will close. The three angels' messages is about choosing whom you will serve and whom you will worship. And in Revelation 14, it says, Fear God and give glory to Him, not to man. It tells us that the church of Rome is the false church of Babylon, and she is full of abominable acts and doctrines. And it also tells us not to receive her mark, which is the mark of Sunday, Sunday worship. God has given this chronology so we can see where we are in the stream of time, and we can then prepare ourselves and others so we will not be deceived. And we can then focus on giving the three angels' messages. So the chronology simply gives us the timeline of the plan of salvation. So what is this plan? The plan of salvation is really a rescue operation that follows the pattern of the weekly cycle, but in years. And we know that there will be 6,000 years of work, followed by 1,000 years of rest called the millennium. This is in Revelation. And in this presentation, we will see how God has woven a timeline of events in the Bible that we can assemble in order to see when the 6,000 years started and when it will end. So how does this work? Um, if you're putting a timeline together and you're using events to back them up, um, those events must be tied to each other in some way. And in this case, we, we'll be able to see that they will be tied back to back. Some of them will be. Um, and some of them will have some overlaps. And we'll explain that as we go. Uh, but we have to know when they are tied back to back in order to have a continuous timeline. Finally, after determining when the 6,000 years of the plan of salvation will end, we will look at the Jubilee and why it performs a pivotal role in the Bible chronology timeline because it actually interlocks with the timeline and it cannot be moved. So, the big question, when did time start? Adam started aging after he sinned because he no longer had access to the tree of life. So the plan of salvation was not put into effect by God on this earth until he actually sinned, until Adam sinned. Therefore, the beginning of the chronology of the earth starts with Adam's sin and not when the earth was created. Now, I'm going to give you this whole presentation in one quote. One quote from Five Bible Commentary, page 1081, paragraph 6. And it goes like this. Christ, in the wilderness of temptation, stood in Adam's place to bear the test he failed to endure. Here, Christ overcame in the sinner's behalf 4,000 years after Adam turned his back upon the light of his home. Separated from the presence of God, the human family had been departing every successive generation farther from the original purity, wisdom, and knowledge which Adam possessed in Eden. 
So it says Christ in the wilderness of temptation, when he was tempted in the wilderness, stood in Adam's place 4,000 years after Adam turned his back upon the light of this home. So where do we start when we're calculating or accumulating this information on the plan of salvation? We begin in the book of Genesis, where the ages of the first humans on earth are listed, starting with Adam and going down through the lineage of Jesus. And if we begin on Genesis 5.3, it says, And Adam lived 130 years and begat Seth. So he lived 130 years, and that's when Seth was born. So we're going to put 130 years up there. The next one is in Genesis 5.6, which says, And Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. All right, so we put 105 years up there. Enos lived 90 years and begat Canaan in Genesis 5.9. Canaan lived 70 years and begat Mahalalil in Genesis 5.12. Mahalalil lived 60 and, two, and 5 years and begat Jared in Genesis 5.15. And so he put 65 years up there. And Jared lived 160 and 2 years and he begat Enoch in Genesis 5.18. So there's 162 years. Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Methuselah lived 187 years and begat Lamech. Lamech lived 182 years and begat Noah. There's 182 years. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the waters was upon the earth in Genesis 7, 6. Add all those together and from the time that Adam sinned to the beginning of the flood is 1,656 years. All right, so there's our first landmark, and there's actually seven of these landmarks that we're going we're gonna to see um, that will be put on the board uh, in a timeline. And this 6,000-year timeline looks as follows. From the start of sin um, is at the top, and the sum of that is going to be at the bottom. So we can count how many years it's been since the time of sin that, that sin started. So this first one is 1,656 years to the time of the flood. All right, the next one. Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. This is found in Genesis 11.10. Now one might think that the words after the flood mean when the flood had finished. But we're going to see here that it actually means after the flood began. Let's look at uh, Genesis 9, 28, and 29. It says, And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Okay, but you remember earlier it said that Noah was 600 years old when the waters began to appear on the face of the earth. So if he was 600 years old when the flood began, and then he lived another 350 years, and he died at 950 years, how much time was there for the flood? The flood actually occurred in about a year, a little over a year's time period. So if Noah lived 600 years before the flood, and then there was an, a year, let's say, let's just round it off to a year, and then there was a year of a flood, uh, wouldn't Noah be 951 years old when he died? That's correct. He would be 951 years old. So the words after the flood, we have to take as meaning after the flood began. So Noah lived after the flood began 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So then we take Genesis 11.10 with Shem, when it says that Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxed two years after the flood. It means after the flood began. So we're going to use... Two years for the time when Arphaxad was born after the flood began. And Arphaxad lived five and thirty years and begat Selah. Selah lived thirty years and begat Eber. Again, we can just go through these genealogies. And Eber lived four and thirty years and begat Peleg. And Peleg lived thirty years and begat Ru. You notice how they're back to back. It's talking about the father and then the son and the son and then his, his son and then his son. 
So we can tie these all together. And Ru lived two and thirty years and begat Sarug. And Sarug lived thirty years and begat Nahor. Nahor lived nine and twenty years and begat Terah. And Terah lived seventy years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran in Genesis 11.26. Well, based on that verse, who was born at the 70 years of Terah's life? Was it Abram, Nahor, or Haran, or was there triplets? Well, we're going to pick one. <laughs> Since Abram is mentioned first, uh, we believe that he was the oldest, and so he was born first when Terah was 70 years old. So therefore, the 70 years refers to Abram's birth, because the Bible chronology leads to Christ through Abram, not Nahor or Haran. So we put 70 years on the screen. And the next connection in the timeline is not going to be the birth of Isaac, as one might think, but rather the covenant with Abram. So if there's no connection again from one event to another, then we won't know where we are in the timeline. When Abram was 90 years old and 9, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after me. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. This is found in Genesis 17, 1 and 10. So Abram was 99 years old when the Lord appeared to Abram, appeared to him and said, This is my covenant, which ye shall keep. You shall circumcise every man child among you. All right, so from the beginning of the flood to the covenant made with Abraham was 391 years. We're going to put that on the timeline. So from the flood to the covenant with Abraham was 391 years. And you can see the total summation is on the bottom. Uh, the covenant made with Abraham was 2,047 years after Adam sinned. Moving on, we're now going to... We're now going to look at the covenant with Abraham from the time that the covenant was given to Abraham to the exodus of the children out of Egypt. And there are several texts for this. One of them is found in Galatians 3, verses 15 to 17, which says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds of, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. All right, so there's three verses there. What does that mean? What it says is, the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, made with Abraham, and the law, which was 430 years after in Mount Sinai, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. So now the sojourning of the children of Israel, Abraham was called by God to sojourn, who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. This is found in Genesis 12, 40, and 41. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So the covenant made with Abraham in Genesis 17, verses 1 and 10, to Israel's exodus from Egypt is 430 years, found in Exodus 12, 40. It can now be added to the timeline. So we're going to add this. 430 years from the time of the covenant made with Abraham to the Exodus. And now we have 2,477 2, years since Adam sinned. That's when the Israelites departed from Egypt. 1 Kings 1 verses 6 says, And it came to pass in the 480th year, after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of, month of Zith, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. So the 480th year extended, as it said, to the fourth year of Solomon's reign. What we want to do is actually make this to the beginning of Solomon's reign. 
So we must subtract the four years to get the first year of his reign. 480 minus 4 is 476. We're going to put that on the timeline. So from the time that the Israelites left Egypt to the start of Solomon's reign was 476 years. That's 2,953 years after Adam sinned. And Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers, and he was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. This is found in 2 Chronicles 9, verses 30 and 31. We're going to put that now on the timeline, that Solomon reigned for 40 years, and then that starts Rehoboam's reign, or what we're going to call the reign of the kings. And that was 2,993 years after Adam sinned. Okay. At this point, we see in the Bible that Israel was divided into two separate nations three years after Solomon's reign of 40 years. Judah had two tribes ruled, ruled by Rehoboam, which is Solomon's son, and Israel had ten tribes that were ruled by Jeroboam. This is found in 2 Chronicles 10 and 1 Kings 12, verses 1 through 20. Now all the reigns of the kings of Judah can be added up from Rehoboam through Zedekiah. Zedekiah was the last king taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. And we're going to do two sets of these. The first ten kings are, are going to be shown on the screen first. Rehoboam, he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. It's found in 2 Chronicles 12, verse 13. Abijah reigned three years in Jerusalem, found in 2 Chronicles 13, 1 and 2. Asa died in <clears throat> 1 and 40th year of his reign, so he ruled for 41 years. Jehoshaphat reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem, found in 2 Chronicles 20, verses 31. Jehoram, he reigned 8 years in Jerusalem. Ahaziah reigned 1 year in Jerusalem. Joash uh, was hid in the house of God six years, and Athaliah reigned over the land. Athaliah was his grandmother. She, she reigned six years. Joash then reigned 40 years in Jerusalem, found in 2 Chronicles 24, verse 1. Amaziah reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and Uzziah reigned 50 and 2 years in Jerusalem. So the first sets of kings from Rehoboam through Uzziah was 222 years. Now the second list of 10 kings starts with Jotham. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. Ahaz reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. Hezekiah reigned 9 and 20 years in Jerusalem, 29 years. Manasseh reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. Ammon reigned two years in Jerusalem. Josiah, he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years, found in 2 Chronicles 34, verse 1. Jehoahaz reigned three months in Jerusalem. Jehoiakim reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And Jehoiachin reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, found in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 9. Zedekiah reigned 11 years in Jerusalem for a total of 171 and a half years from the reign of Jotham through the reign of Zedekiah. So adding together both sets of the ten reigns for the kings of Judah yields 222 years for the first set and 171 and a half years for the second set gives us 393.5 years for all 20 kings. Now, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah were reigning in Judah during the three sieges by King Nebuchadnezzar. That means we cannot put the end of Zedekiah's reign and the start of the 70-year captivity back to back. The captivity actually started in Jehoiakim's reign so the two time periods overlap each other. We'll have to calculate this overlap and subtract it from the timeline to get the starting and ending points correct. So let's do that.
But first, let's look at Patriarchs and Prophets, page 428, because it gives us a clue why this is true. It says, in Spirit of Prophecy, Patriarchs and Prophets, when early in the reign of Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar for the first time besieged and captured Jerusalem and carried away Daniel and his companions with the others specifically chosen for service in the court of Babylon, the faith of the Hebrew captives was tried to the utmost. So this establishes that Daniel and his companions were carried away the very first time that Nebuchadnezzar besieged and captured Jerusalem. Okay, that gives us a starting point. Now let's look at uh, 4 Bible Commentary, page 11 to 58. Because she goes further to say that in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, very soon after Daniel was taken to Babylon, Jeremiah predicted the captivity of many of the Jews as their punishment for not heeding the word of the Lord. So this tells us that not only was this the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar upon Jerusalem when Daniel and his companions were taken to Babylon, but it was also in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. All right, moving on. It says the Chaldeans were to be used as the instrument by which God would chastise his disobedient people. Their punishment was to be in proportion to their intelligence and to the warnings that they had despised. This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, the prophet declared, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So in this quote, we see that in the fourth year of Jehoiakim is when the captivity started, and it would go for 70 years. Thus we see that this happened, that the start of the 70 years of the house of Israel's captivity started with Daniel and his companions in the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign. So we saw earlier that Jehoiakim reigned 11 years. We saw that Jehoiachin reigned just one-fourth of a year, or three months. And Zedekiah reigned 11 years. That gives us a total of 22 and a quarter years. So this overlap must compute as follows. We saw earlier that 393 and a half years was a total uh, amount of time for the 20 kings. We subtract these three kings of 22 and a quarter years out. That gives us 371 and a quarter years. And we add back in Jehoiakim's reign. Remember it said that it was in the fourth year. So four years had not transpired, but it was during the fourth year. So we're going to add three and three quarters years to Jehoiakim's reign, which brings us to 375 years from the end of Solomon's reign to the time that the Israelites went into captivity with Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to put that on the timeline now, 375 years and when they were put into captivity. The next time period is the length of Judah's captivity in Babylon, which we saw already. It's also found in Jeremiah 25, verses 9 and 11. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Jeremiah 25, 9 and 11. We're going to put that 70 years in the timeline. And that shows us that from the time of Adam's sin to when Judah was actually released from Babylon was 3,438 years since Adam sinned. All right. Daniel's prayer in chapter 9, it says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 556, had been offered in the first year of Darius, the Median monarch whose general Cyrus had wrested from Babylonia the scepter of universal rule. The reign of Darius was honored of God. To him was sent the angel Gabriel to confirm and to strengthen him. Found in Daniel 11, verse 1. Upon his death, about two years of the fall of Babylon, within about two years of the fall of Babylon, Cyrus succeeded to the throne. 
And the beginning of his reign marked the completion of the 70 years since the first company of Hebrews had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar from their Judean home to Babylon. So again, in this quote, we see again that the Hebrews first taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar uh, from that point until the end of the reign was 70 years. Now we can use a secular date for the Jews' first release from Babylon under Cyrus the Great of 536 BC. 536 BC is well documented in secular records, and so we can now use this date. So we can populate from this point the seven biblical time periods with their BC date simply by reverse calculation. So here we go. 536, 606, 961, 1021, 1497, 1927, 2318, and 3974 BC is when Adam sinned. The great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years is soon to close. This is found in Great Controversy, page 518. So now let's add Christ's ministry to the timeline and the calculation for the end of 6,000 years of sin. 562 years later, Christ started his ministry in A.D. 27, which is exactly 4,000 years after Adam sinned in 3974 B.C. If we add 2,000 years from there to give us a 6,000 year mark, that brings us to the year 2027 A.D., not too far away. Okay. So how do we know that the end date for the 6,000 years is correct? It must co coincide with the Jubilee. I'm going to take you through early writings, page 34 and on, because uh, we're going to see how the time, in the time of the end, that is described by, early, by Ellen White in early writings, will, will bring to us to the Time when the Jubilee is announced. So let's read this. Let's go, let's go through this. Early Writings, page 34. In the time of trouble, we all fled from the cities and villages. This is what God showed her in vision. So she said, we all fled from the cities and villages in the time of trouble, but we were pursued by the wicked who entered the houses of the saints with a sword. They raised the sword to kill us, but it broke and fell as powerless as straw. Then we all cried day and night for deliverance, and the cry came up before God. The sun came up, and the moon stood still. The streams ceased to flow. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. But there was one clear place of settled glory, whence came the voice of God, like many waters, which shook the heavens and the earth, the sky opened and shut and was in commotion. The mountains shook like a reed in the wind and cast out ragged rocks all around. The sea boiled like a pot and cast out stones upon the land. And as God spoke the day and the hour of Jesus' coming and delivered the everlasting covenant to his people, he spoke one sentence and then paused while the words were rolling through the earth. The Israel of God stood with their eyes fixed upward, listening to the words as they came from the mouth of Jehovah and rolled through the earth like peals of loudest thunder. It was awfully solemn. And at the end of every sentence, the saints shouted, Glory! Hallelujah! Their countenances were lighted up with the glory of God. And they shone with the glory as did the face of Moses when he came down from Sinai. The wicked could not look on them for the glory. And when the never-ending blessing was pronounced on those who had honored God in keeping His Sabbath day holy, there was a mighty shout of victory over the beast and over His image. Then commenced the jubilee, when the land should rest. I saw the pious slave rise in triumph and victory and shake off the chains that bound him, while his wicked master was in confusion and knew not, knew not what to do. For the wicked could not understand the words of the voice of God. 
soon appeared the great white cloud. It looked more lovely than ever before, and on it sat the Son of Man. So we see that the Jubilee occurs at the second coming of Jesus. So how can we understand and count the Jubilee cycle? That's really what we want to know now. How do we understand this Jubilee? I don't think anyone ever has counted correctly the Jubilee cycle and when to begin counting of the Jubilee. But at least we do see that the Jubilee occurs at the second coming of Christ. The Jubilee actually starts in Leviticus 25, verses 1 through 10. So let's go through that. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai. And these are key words I've, I've highlighted in, in orange. It says, In Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years." Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the Day of Atonement. In the Day of Atonement ye shall make the trumpet sound throughout your land. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a Jubilee unto you. And ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. Leviticus 25, verses 1 through 10. So let's review what we just read. The Lord spoke to Moses when he was in Mount Sinai. He said, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, but in the seventh year it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land. Thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. So seven times seven is forty-nine years. Simple math. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land. So counting of the Jubilee must start when they come into the land. And it must be six years of work, then a Sabbath year of rest. There must be seven times seven years of these Sabbath rests, or 49 years. And then the 50th year is the Jubilee. Now, counting the 49 years is actually the same process as counting the days of the week. If we count the days of the week, we know that Sunday is the first day. And if we count to the sixth day, that's Friday. And the seventh day is Sabbath, this, the seventh day of the week. Um, if we are to count, let's say, two weeks, we would then say that Sunday is the eighth day, but it also is the first day. So um, you would say that uh, day one through seven and day eight is Sunday, but it's also the first day again, so you can count seven more days to the seventh day Sabbath. And the 15th day is Sunday, but it is also the first day again, and so on until we get to the 49th day or year. And then the 50th year is again Sunday, or the first year, or the first day, or the first year of the next Jubilee cycle. This is how it tells us to count the Jubilee cycle in Leviticus 25. If we don't do it this way, then we are not going to have correct results. So let me show you graphically with these slides how to count the Jubilee cycle. Again, the weekly cycle would be day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and the seventh day is the Sabbath. We'll do that again for the second uh, set of weeks, the third week, the fourth week, the fifth the 6th, and the 7th. So that's our weekly cycle. 
So there's that, in this case, it represents seven weeks, but, seven, but the weeks also represent years for the Jubilee cycle, so that can also represent 49 years. But let's, let's do the counting now sequentially. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for the first set of years. Then we have the eighth year, and then we continue counting through 13. We have the 14th, et cetera, 15, uh, the 21st, first uh, Sabbath, the 28th, the uh, 35th, the 42nd, and the 49th. So there's your 49 weeks or years of the sequential counting uh, of the Jubilee cycle. The 50th year starts on the next cycle of Jubilee. And you have seven years again, followed by the 49 years, and we have our complete counting of the next cycle to 49 years. This is how you count the Jubilee cycle. Okay, let's apply this a little bit further. We need to find out when they came into the land. Now that we know how to count the cycle, let's figure out when they came in the land so we can figure out where to start. We're going to start with Joshua 14, verses 5 through 10, where it says, As the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did as they divided the land. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee and Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was Moses when the servant of the Lord sent me, sorry, forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up from me, with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly follow the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, <clears throat> the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. Caleb said he was forty years old when Moses swore on that day, saying, Sure to the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. So we know that the children of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Let's insert this 40 years in there. We've got 40 years. And so this is when they entered the land of Canaan, is it not? But wait a minute. For Caleb was already in his 40th year when he was spying out the land. His quotation now, he says, I am four score and five years. So, so he is uh, later. So he is now 85 years old on his birthday. So we must therefore subtract a year to have a full, complete years rather than calling his 40th year a full year because it was not. So it was 44 years in duration of time from the spying out of the land until Caleb's 85th birthday. We're going to put those four years in there and see that the land was divided in 1453 B.C., or 2,521 years after Adam sinned. When I first saw this, I decided to put these numbers in a spreadsheet. Everyone knows about how to use Excel, right? Most of us do. So I put these numbers in a spreadsheet, and I'm listing this on the screen now for your benefit. Um, Jubilee 1, they were supposed to start counting the Jubilee years starting in 2,521 years after Adam sinned or in 1453 B.C., when they came into the land. So the next jubilee was going to be in 1404 B.C., or 2,570 years after Adam had sinned. Um, I'm going to show you a proof here that these numbers are correct from 2521 to 2570, and of course 2619, just to show that these numbers are actually uh, provable. 
So let's take this first counting from 2521 or 1453 BC to the next Jubilee. It, we're going to use the same process of the weekly cycle. So they came into the land on a Sunday, let's, let's call that, and that will be uh, day one or year one in 1453 BC. And you see Monday was the second one in 1452, 1451 uh, was the third one, or Tuesday, 1450. Remember, BC counts down. Uh, Wednesday was the fourth, Thursday was the fifth, Friday was the sixth, Saturday was the seventh year, or, or day of rest. Uh, so let's just kind of fast forward down to the next page. Again, 2535 and 1439 BC was the 15th, uh, start of the 15th week or 15th year. And at the bottom of the screen is the 28th. We see that was the Saturday or the 7th year. And another screen here, I just clicked forward. 1425 BC was the 29th uh, consecutive year. Down at the bottom is the 42nd consecutive year, or a Saturday. And on this last screen, we see 43 was, the, was, a, was a Sunday. And year 50 is the Jubilee, which is the 25th, 2570 years since Adam sinned, or 1404 BC. So this confirms that we are counting correctly. All right, so let's go back to the original... Uh, Excel spreadsheet, we see that 2570 or 1404 BC is the next one. And I'm going to for fast forward through all these numbers, let you look, look, th look them up on the screen here. At the bottom of the screen is the 16th Jubilee uh, or 1718 BC. And we're just going to keep looking. And look through these numbers with me, and you'll see that they're kind of, you know, odd numbers. 1306, 1257, uh, 1012. I mean, there's nothing really you know, spectacular about these numbers, I don't think. All right, the next screen here. Although we see down here at the bottom where, uh, in the bottom of the screen, where 32 BC was a jubilee, and the next jubilee was actually in 18 AD. And Jesus started his ministry in 27 AD. So nine years prior to Jesus starting his ministry, there was a jubilee in the year 18 AD. Okay, moving ahead with the next screen, we see that uh, in the year 116 AD was a jubilee, 4,089 years since Adam sinned. Uh, just keep looking at those numbers, they all look just kind of okay, whatever, right? Um, we have 851 AD at the bottom of the screen. All right, the next screen again, the year 900 AD was a jubilee. And at the bottom of the screen, uh, 1635. So again, all those numbers just kind of whatever they are. Look at this last one. 1684 A.D. was a jubilee. And it was 5,657 years since Adam sinned. The next one is 5,706 years, 5,755 years, etc., etc. But when you get to the 6,000 year mark, it comes out exactly to 6,000 years since Adam sinned and exactly with the year 2027. Now, I tried to move these numbers back and forth to see if there was just some glitch. Why would this come out perfectly like this? And it did it the very first time. I didn't reverse engineer this. I didn't know how to reverse engineer it. I just followed what God was showing me in His Word. When they come into the land, Caleb's 85th birthday, et cetera, et cetera. And I put that number in the spreadsheet and I calculated it exactly like God tells us to calculate the Jubilee. And it came out the first time at this number, 6,000 years in 2027. So it, it, it just put tingles up and down my spine uh, when I realized the gravity of this moment, that this is something real here. This is not something that you can create or manufacture on their own. This is, it, 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 there's just too much going on here. It's just too complicated for it to come out too simply in this, in this manner. So uh, anyway, I just share that with you because it was just amazing to me. So in the year 2027, 
is the 6,000th year of the Jubilee. And we, we saw earlier that in early writings, there is a Jubilee when Jesus comes. So God said to start counting the Jubilee on the 2,521st year from when Adam sinned. In 49-year cycle increments, according to the weekly cycle, and proclaim a jubilee on the 50th year, which is also the first year of the next cycle. The last jubilee comes out to exactly 6,000 elapsed time years in 2027, thus aligning perfectly with chronological time. So the next jubilee occurs in the 6,000th year since Adam sinned in 2027. Let's look at some landmark jubilees. This is also very interesting. In 1453 BC is when they came into the land and Caleb was 85 years old. Caleb died in 1438 BC and Joshua died at 110, year old, 110 years old in 1412 AD, uh, BC. It's found in Judges uh, 2 verses 8. It says in Judges 3 that Israel did evil for eight years. And if you keep adding those eight years up, um, we come to the first jubilee in 1404 BC. And this is found in Judges 3.9 when Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, actually delivered Israel from Cush, Shanrish, Shanhayim in Judges 3.9. I don't know if I said that correctly, but you get the idea. He's a long name. And so we see, remember the Jubilee is a time of deliverance when the slaves are set free and when everyone receives his possession, his land back. And so that actually happened in that time period, uh, in that year of 1404 BC. And Othniel was a type of Christ that delivered Israel from this king. 1364 BC was the end of the 40 years when the land rests from war. And the next jubilee uh, that has significance is when King David started his reign. Now we know that David was a type of Christ, a deliverer, and the start of his reign was a jubilee year in BC 1061. Solomon then reigned for 40 years until 1021 BC, and he started building the temple in 1017 BC, 480 years after the Exodus. Another landmark jubilee is after Hezekiah's reign. Um, this actual event, uh, if you look this up in 2 Kings uh, chapter 18 and 19, you'll see that um, God told them that there would be a deliverance from Sennacherib, Sennacherib, and um, they would start planting and sowing, and they would start doing that in the eighth year. Well, it's the eighth year after a jubilee that they are told to do that. And if you look in Leviticus 25, 21, so this lines up perfectly with that event. The jubilee occurred in 718 BC, and eight years later they were told to sow and reap. All right, in 606 BC is when the Babylonian captivity uh, occurred, the first siege by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Zedekiah reigned until 599, uh, sorry, he started in 599 and he ended in 588 BC. And in 571 was another Jubilee year. The invasion of Babylon by Darius was in 538. In 536 BC, the decree of uh, Cyrus to rebuild Jerusalem was uh, was announced, which was the first release of the Jews. Ahasuerus, he reigned, which is also known as uh, Xerxes I, and there was actually a jubilee year in 473 BC uh, with Queen Esther. And if you can read the story in the book of Esther of how uh, the Jews were persecuted and a death decree was announced, but then it was turned around and the Jews were allowed to persecute all those who were trying to kill them. And it was, a, it was on a jubilee year. In 465, Artaxerxes reigns. And Artaxerxes decreed his decree to rebuild Jerusalem in 457 BC, uh, which began the 2300-day prophecy. 
Artaxerxes uh, finished reigning in 424 BC. William Miller was born in 1782 AD, which was a jubilee year. Uh, William Miller was the founder or the leader of the Millerite movement. That is the movement where the different Protestants, uh, Protestants from different religions, joined together and read the Bible, and they figured out that Jesus would come back in 1844, which, of course, was the wrong event. It was the right date. It was when Jesus went into the most holy place, but it was the wrong event. Jesus obviously hasn't come yet. So those days should be shortened. Persecution ended prior to 1798. And we see the next series of uh, jubilees occurred in 1831, 1880, 1929, 1978, and the next one is going to occur in 2027 on Christ's second return. Just to kind of expand a little bit on the persecution Let's look at what it says in Great Controversy, the 1888 version, page 266. The persecution of the church did not continue throughout the entire period of the 1260 years. God's in mercy to his people cut short the time of their fiery trial. In foretelling the great tribulation to befall the church, the Savior said, Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake... Those days shall be shortened. Through the influence of the Reformation, the persecution was brought to an end prior to 1798. Christ was not in as favorable a position in the desolate wilderness to endure the temptations of Satan as was Adam when he was tempted in Eden. The Son of God humbled himself and took man's na nature after the race had wandered 4,000 years from Eden and from their original state of purity and uprightness. Sin had, sin had been making its terrible marks upon the race for ages, and physical, mental, and moral degeneracy prevailed throughout the human family. This is found in One Selected Messages, page 267. So again, more confirmation that when Jesus was in the wilderness to be tempted of Satan was 4,000 years from the time that Adam sinned. Again, five Bible commentary, page uh, 1081. We saw this in the beginning. Christ in the wilderness of temptation stood in Adam's place to bear the test he had failed to endure. Here Christ overcame in the sinner's behalf 4,000 years after Adam turned his back upon the light of his home. Separated from the presence of God, the human family had been de departing every successive generation farther from the original purity, wisdom, and knowledge which Adam possessed in Eden. Another quotation from the Review of You and Herald on July 28, 1874 tells us, The Son of God humbled himself and took man's nature after the race had wandered 4,000 years from Eden, and from their original state of purity and uprightness. Sin had been making its terrible marks upon the race for ages. And physical, mental, and moral degeneracy prevailed throughout the entire the human family. When Adam was assailed by the tempter in Eden, he was without the taint of sin. Christ, in the wilderness of temptation, stood in Adam's place to bear the test he failed to endure. The typical feast days have all been completed except for the Feast of Tabernacles. Christ replaced the typical with the antitypical when he was the sacrificial lamb. We are living in the antitypical day of atonement since October 22, 1844. And God is a God of order, and Christ died on the very day of Passover at the time, the very time of the evening sacrifice. The Spirit of Prophecy states that at the second coming of Christ, we will be seven days ascending to heaven and enjoying the banquet in heaven on the eighth day when Christ will gird himself and serve us. And this is found in Review and Herald, July 21, 1851, paragraph 7. So we see that this is the antitypical Feast of Tabernacles. So Christ's second coming will then be sometime in the fall of 2027, right before the Feast of Tabernacles. And God will actually announce the day and hour of His return 
during the seventh plague. So from the fall of 2027, we can back up three and a half years to determine approximately the time when the papacy will rise in Revelation 13.1 and rule for 1290 days, according to Daniel 12.11, the spring of 2024. So the question has always been, hey, your time setting. Uh, no man knows the day or the hour of Jesus' coming. And we are not to live on the basis of time setting. Well, this is, again, not an attempt to do that, but this is simply showing you what the Bible says and what the Spirit of Prophecy says about where we are in the stream of time. And through simple math, we can figure some of these things out. But we will never know the actual day and hour of Jesus' second coming until God announces it. Why is that? Well, for two reasons. God has said He's, he's, not, he's not given that information to mankind. And Spirit of Prophecy says that if it was given to mankind, then we would not make the right use of it. We would delay our preparation and we would not announce to the world that Jesus is coming at the right timing, etc. The other issue here is that during this time period of the end, there's going to be so much, so many calamities and confusion. There's going to be so many things going on that the earth and the cycle of the earth, the, the cycle of the seasons will still continue, but they will be confused. And the way that the Day of Atonement is calculated today is based on the barley harvest. It's the way it's been always been done in years past. But we think and we believe that that barley harvest will not occur in the last final year of 2027 because of all the calamities that will be happening on this earth and all the wars that will be happening, the mass confusion that will be occurring on this planet. So there won't be any way for God's people or anyone to actually calculate or determine the day and hour of Jesus' second return. But God in His mercy will announce the day and hour so that God's people will know exactly when Jesus is coming. And this, we believe, will be at the end of the 1,335 days found in Daniel 12.12. 12. So let's get the complete picture here. The Sunday Law will therefore be enforced sometime in the spring of 2024, which starts the 1,260 literal days found in Daniel 12.7, the time times and a half, otherwise known as the time appointed. If you haven't seen the other previous three uh, presentations on the time of the end, go back to the first one because that's where uh, we go through the presentation where the Bible reveals this information on the time appointed in Daniel 12.7. Let's look at this graphically. The end shall be at the time appointed. That's, over, that's stated over and over again in the book of Daniel. It starts with a preparation time, which is where we are now. And in 2024, the spring of 2024, is when all nations will drink of the wine of the wrath of, of her fornication, meaning the papacy. They will lay down their sovereignty to the papacy and they will set him up, or the Pope, as the, the one world ruler. That will be in the spring of 2024. That starts two time periods. It starts the 1,335 days and the 1290 days of the rule of the papacy. After that, fire will come down from heaven. They will use that working of that miracle to convince people that they have uh, God's approval and that God is with them and that everyone should pass a Sunday law. At that point, the people of the nation of the United States will demand from the legislatures, they will demand a Sunday law. We saw that in the Spirit of Prophecy. That's only a 30-day time period. Legislation will then be passed, and this is when the sanctuary of strength is polluted in Daniel 11.31. This is starting of the judgment of the living, and it actually starts when that law is enforced. This is what Spirit of Prophecy tells us. So people that are worshiping on Sunday today are not receiving the mark of the beast. It's only when they are intelligently shown that that this is not the true Sabbath. It is a false Sabbath. It's an apostate Sabbath. It is the sun worship. It's from the people in, in, in times past who worshipped the sun, the sun god. 
Uh, this is where it all started. And once they are shown that and they still continue to worship on Sunday, when Sunday law is enforced, that is when people will receive the mark of the beast. Following this will be the uh, national ruin of the United States. National apostasy is followed by national ruin, which is followed by a no buy and no sell. So just like we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic or pandemic, whatever you want to call it, where people had to wear a face mask in order to go into a grocery store and buy food, this will be even more significant. Uh, your bank accounts will be turned off. You will be not allowed to go to work anymore and you will not be able to buy or sell. So this is why God has been telling his people to get out in the country, get your gardens designed and planted and growing, and be out of the city when this happens, because you won't be able to buy or sell. Uh, during this time is also known as the shaking time. We saw this in the second presentation. The three angels' messages will be proclaimed throughout the entire earth, and at the final closing of probation is when the loud cry will be, will be given. The loud cry is simply in Revelation 18.1, the, the, the fourth angel coming down out of heaven, proclaiming with a loud voice not to receive the mark of the beast. Uh, this is God's people joining hand in hand throughout the entire earth, just, just, just pleading with people not to receive the mark of the beast, but to fear God and give glory to Him. This will be followed by the close of probation when every single person on the entire planet has made their decision either for God or against Him. And this is when the seventh angel sounds in Revelation 16, 7. This is then when the daily is restored to Christ. Remember, the daily is the transfer of power or the, the rulership of the scepter. Christ will take that scepter back from Satan and this starts the seven last plagues. This is when a final death decree will be, will be given. And this is when we need to flee to the mountains. So we'll leave our, our homes in the country for retired mountain homes or wherever we can find in the mountains to, to live and dwell. This is also the time period when the apostate Protestant kings, they turn on the great whore or the papacy and they... They strip her naked and they burn her with fire. So she is destroyed at the end of the 1290 days. The day and hour of, of Jesus' return is then announced at the end of the 1335 days during the fall of 2027. And again, God says in Isaiah 1312, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. That is your character. God is going to change your life, change your mind, change your way of thinking. If you let Him, He will transform you into His likeness that you may be sealed for eternity with a pure heart and a pure mind and that your sins will be blotted out at that time of probation closing. Your sins will be blotted out from the record. You will no longer have a criminal record for all the things that were done you'll be clean and pure and sealed that way for eternity so that it will be as though you have never sinned. So that for eternity, you will not have to think or remember any of this, any of the things that have happened on this planet. That is such a, a wonderful thing that God has done for us and is going to do for us. So let your characters be refined as gold. The testing process is going on now. This is why it's called the shaking time and the sifting time coming up because everyone will be shaken from their middle ground to either be on God's side or to be on man's side, i.e. the devil. Let's have some closing thoughts here. In early writings, page 75, she says, The Lord has shown me that the message of the third angel must go and be proclaimed to the scattered children of the Lord, but it must not be hung on time. So presenting this message to you today, I'm trying to emphasize this point to you as, as, as best that I can. God has given us the information, but that's not what we're to use to promote to the world. We're not to go to the world with this information, but we're simply to understand it 
and know where we are in the stream of time so that we can give the three angels messages so that people won't make the wrong decision when the Sunday law is presented to them in deception and coercion that they, are, they, they will be forced. Either you're going to lose your job uh, or you're going to keep your job and get the mark of the beast. But they're not going to be told it that way. But that's exactly what's going to happen. I saw that some were getting a false excitement arising from preaching time. But the third angel's message is stronger than time can be. I saw that this message can stand on its own foundation and needs not time to strengthen it. And that it will go in mighty power and do its work and will be cut short in righteousness. So will the time be cut short in righteousness? This is also a misnomer that many of God's people are thinking that God's going to cut short the time in righteousness. No, He cuts short the work. He cuts short the persecution in righteousness. That's what we've been reading in these quotations. So God in His mercy is only going to allow the devil to go so far in persecuting God's people. It will go in mighty power and do its work. This work of preaching the three, three angels' messages. In Maranatha, page 19, paragraph 4, it says, 3 and 4, Had the Church of Christ done her appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would before this have been warned, and the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in power and great glory. So if God's Church had done her appointed work, God could have come already. It is the unbelief, the worldliness unconsecration and strife among the Lord's professed people, not, not with the world, but among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years, as did the children of Israel. So the children of Israel in the, in the time of the wilderness. But for Christ's sake, His people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. So don't charge God that, hey, you're not coming back. Why aren't you coming back, Lord? Uh, because of our own insubordination against God. Uh, God is simply waiting for His people to, to accept Him and to humbly come before Him and confess and forsake their sins and ask for the cleansing of their souls through Christ's blood. This is what God is waiting for, but time is still marching on. Brethren and sisters, would that I might say something to awaken you in the importance of this time. The significance of the events that are now taking place, I point you to the aggressive movements now being made for the restriction of religious liberty. God's sanctified memorial has been torn down, and in its place, a false Sabbath, bearing no sanctity, and this stands before the world. And while the powers of darkness are stirring up the elements from beneath, the Lord God of heaven is sending power from above to meet the emergency by arousing His living agencies to exalt the law of heaven. Now, just now, is our time to work in foreign countries. Some more closing thoughts that are found in Testimonies, Volume 6, page 18. As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Our people are not half awake to do all in their power, with the facilities within their reach to extend the message of warning. That's a pretty solemn words. We are approaching and fast approaching this time of restriction of liberty of conscience. They will compel you to honor the false Sabbath. The Lord of heaven will not send upon the world his judgments for disobedience and transgression until he has sent his watchmen to give the warning. He will not close up the period of probation until the message shall be more distinctly proclaimed. The law of God is to be magnified. Its claims must be presented 
in their true sacred character, that the people may be brought to decide for or against the truth. Yet the work will be cut short in righteousness. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other, to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel. So everyone, I want to thank you for listening and watching. I want you to understand that we are living in the stream of time very, very close to Christ's second coming. But this is not the impetus of our message. Our message to the world is to give the three angels, fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. Don't fear man, fear God. Choose God. And then the second one, Babylon Babylon has fallen, that great city which made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She's making all the nations, through her deception, follow her false dogmas, her false doctrines, and especially the one main point of controversy now before us, the issue of whether to worship on the first day of the week, Sunday, or the seventh day of the week, Sabbath. And don't be deceived. If you Google which day is the day of the week for Saturday, they're going to tell you now, which they just made this change on, in Google back in September of 2021, they made the change to say that Saturday is the sixth day of the week based on ISO standards. So in Daniel 7, it says that he, the papacy, would think to change times and laws. And this is what they're actually doing. They've changed times. They've changed the law of God to say that the first day of the week is the Sabbath or Sunday. They have now changed the time to say that Sabbath is the sixth day of the week, but it's not. It's the seventh day of the week. It's been that way forever. <laughs> so don't be deceived by these things that is out there on the Google platform. Remember, and then the third angel's message is not to receive the mark of the beast. So if you worship on Sunday when you've been told not to, and it's being enforced, that's when you will receive the mark of the beast. And God says, don't be deceived by that. Worship on the seventh day of the week. Worship on my Sabbath. Because it is a sign between me and thee throughout all generations. This is a sign that God has where... The world will see that we are His people is because we worship on the seventh day of the week. Well, thank you again. I pray that all this information will not be so overwhelming. If you want to go back, just rewind it and re rewind it and so you can look and see how, how things develop. Uh, it's amazing how the Jubilee has, uh, is, is locked into the chronology. It can't be moved. Try it. I, I challenge you to try moving this Jubilee in some way or fashion, it'll, it'll jump by 49 years one way or the other if you do. So what, what's the point in that? We know that we are at the end of the 6,000 years very closely at the end of time. But the main point again is fear God and give glory to Him. He is your creator. That's why He deserves your worship. May God bless you as you contemplate these things. Thank you.